Welcome to Village Church. We're committed to seeing people transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus. We do this through focusing on gospel, community, and culture. Learn more about us at thisisvillagechurch.com. Welcome to Village Church, everyone. Uh, my name is Fanu, and uh, I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Village. Uh, thank you for, so much for joining us from across all of our locations uh, and online. And if you are new with us today, a special welcome to you. Uh, we're in a series called Misquoted. Uh, this is week two of the series. And uh, what we're really doing is just taking um, Bible passages that are often just used in maybe just the wrong context or just popularly not applied correctly and, uh, and looking at the context and like what was the original intent and what was the original meaning of the of those verses. And so today we're going to be in uh, Revelation chapter 3 and 20. But before I go into the verse, um, I want to share this quick story of uh, how I experienced uh, uh, the danger of misquoting something. So a couple of days ago, I was in Surrey and uh, went to get a haircut. Uh, and uh, new uh, barbershop, new barber. And I went to this, uh, to this barbershop, sat down in the chair, and the guy asked me, so how would you like me to cut your hair? And uh, I said to him two terms I should not have put together. If you notice that I look half bald today, it's uh, <laughs> partly because of this. I said, uh, I'd like uh, skin fade mid-high. Oh, skin fade mid-high. He says, sure, no problem. So he takes his razor and he goes right at the top, of, right here, and he, and, he, and he cuts right around my head, like a line, like a strong line, right around. And I said, hold on, hold on, what are you doing? He says, you said, you said skin fade mid-high. That means you start from here and go skin all the way down. I said, that is not what I wanted. I've never, I've never had this kind of haircut before. So I call my wife and like, babe, do not freak out. I want to show you something. Of course, that never, that never works because of course she's going to freak out. So I show her what it looked like and she's like, Fidu, what did you do to your hair? I said, babe, I don't know. I put these two terms together and this is what he did. And uh, anyways, long story short, I had to leave that barbershop and go to another spot and get them to fix it sort of so I look half presentable today. So anyways, the point is... The, that sometimes we use terms and words that we don't fully understand and we don't get the result we're looking for. And today we're in uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And uh, here's what it says. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So of course, this is Jesus talking about this idea of wanting to have relationship, wanting to have connection, wanting to have communion. But often this scripture is used in the context of a new believer, somebody that is not a Christian, somebody that is outside of the family of faith, someone that's not yet become a follower of Christ. And so we apply it. In fact, I've used this years ago in evangelistic sermons to say, hey, if you're not a Christian, Jesus is at the, the door of your heart. If you open the door, he's going to come in. And so that's how it's typically applied. But actually the context here is Jesus is talking to a church. The church that is located in the city of Laodicea. And he's speaking to Christians. And so we're going to unpack, well, why is Jesus saying this to a church? Why is he saying this to Christians, people who already know him, people who already believe in him? So let's look at this. Well, he starts off by saying, behold. So what he's saying is, he says, I want you to look. See, one of the things that we are called to do as Christians is that we are constantly looking at our lives, constantly evaluating our lives to say, well, where am I? It's easy sometimes to get distracted by the busyness of life, by the activity of the church, by doing all the kind, different kinds of things that we are usually involved with. And, and we don't actually look and say, well, well, hold on, where am I at in relationship to Jesus? What is actually going on in my life? Often what happens is we think Jesus is with us. We think we've got him. We think we are passionate. We think we are where we used to be, but we've actually drifted away. Part of the Christian call is to uh, spend time in the word, is to meditate on God's word, is to build a relationship with Jesus. The reason we do that, we call them spiritual disciplines, is you want to constantly come back into alignment, constantly remind 
remind yourself of the passion and the calling and the vision that God has for your life as a follower of Jesus. But it's easy sometimes to forget. I was uh, on a trip to Edmonton a couple of weekends ago. I was preaching in Edmonton and my first time in the city in Alberta. And uh, I uh, got on the plane. Of course, I've done a, a ton of traveling recently to speak. And so I'm pretty familiar with airports, especially Toronto Pearson and, and airplanes and baggage and all this kind of stuff, you know, that you have to do when you travel. And that particular trip, I decided instead of uh, checking in uh, my luggage, I was just going to take a little roller bag as a carry-on on top of my backpack with my laptop and my Bible and stuff. And so I, uh, I get to the gate and all that, everything's good. They actually board me earlier than most people on the plane. So I'm in the plane probably 30, 40 minutes or so before everyone else is boarded. And uh, so during that time, you know, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm constantly, this is the thing about me, I'm, I'm constantly listening to something. It's just like, Fanu, you're constantly listening to something. I'm like, yeah, I want to be productive. I want to be efficient. I want to make more, the most of all the time I have, especially if I'm just sitting around. So I'm listening to stuff and, and, and scrolling YouTube, watching videos, listening to podcasts. And eventually they, they close the doors of the plane. They have to go to the de-icing station. So go, they go there. And, uh, and then eventually after de-icing, they're uh, on the taxi, on the runway, uh, about to take off. And all of a sudden I have this, this thought come into my head. I said, I remember lifting my backpack up to the upper, you know, the compartment, the overhead compartment. I don't remember lifting my, my carry-on bag. I said, oh, I just must have forgotten. So I, I take off the seatbelt. I shouldn't be doing this, but I take off the seatbelt, jump up, open up the overhead compartment, and sure enough, guys, all that there is is my backpack. I had left my roller bag back at the gate in the airport. I could see the terminal. With my, I'm like, I went to the stewardess and said, is there any way? They're like, sorry, sir, it's too late. There's no way. So eventually I ended up in Edmonton and uh, I told the crew there, I said, uh, it's my first time preaching in a city where everything I'm wearing is local. So I had to go buy all of my stuff because I didn't take my bag. Here's the point. Often what happens is like, you don't realize. I'm, I thought to myself, I sat in that plane for 40 minutes, not realizing that I was actually missing my bag. I'd forgotten something. And part of what Jesus says to this church is, you need to think about how you're doing when it comes to your calling. How are you doing when it comes to your prayer life? How are you doing when it comes to your devotional life? How are you doing when it comes to your passion for Jesus, your first love in your relationship for Jesus? Take a moment right now, across all of our sights. Say, where am I in relation to Jesus? Where is Jesus in relation to how I live my life? I know I'm called a Christian. I know I go to church. But really, practically, what does this actually look like for me? Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis in, his, uh, in, in the Screwtape Letters, he uh, obviously talks about uh, uh, Screwtape, who's a senior demon who's training this uh, younger demon, uh, uh, Wormwood. And he's talking to him about strategies to keep people away from God. And here's what Screwtape says. He says, you will say that these are very small sins. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you, are, you separate the man from the enemy. The enemy here is God. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft, underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. He's saying it's, it's the gentle drift that's the most dangerous, not the big sins. But it's sometimes we just get cold towards Jesus. We, we drift away from him. And so Jesus is talking to his church. And let's look at, let's look at the context here in, in verse 14. He says, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen. What does it mean when Jesus says, I'm the amen? The word amen is basically the God of truth. In Isaiah 65, it talks about the God of truth. And what it is, is the God of the amen. What, he, what Jesus is saying is, guys, I am the truth. And he says, the faithful and true witness. The faithful and true witness. Jesus is saying, listen, some people are faithful, meaning they're with you, they're loyal, but they're not truthful. Some people are truthful, but they're not actually with you when you need them. He says, I am loyal, I am with you, I am faithful, but I'm also true. I will always tell you the truth about where your life is at. And then he says, the beginning of God's creation. The word beginning here doesn't mean that he was the first of God's created beings. 
as some cults believe. What it actually means, the word there, arche, means the ruler, the agent of all of creation. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, before I begin to talk to you about your life, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that my judgment is based on who I am. It's not based on what's popular in your culture today. Well, everyone's doing it this way. Well, people don't go to church every week anymore, you know? That's just not culturally the way we do it. Everyone doesn't serve. I don't need to give a tithe, the 10% to the church. I can just give what I feel like. This is where culture is at. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. If you're going to follow me, what matters is not what you think is true. What matters is what I say is true. Because I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life, Jesus said to his disciples. This is the whole point of the Christian message, is that we look and find our center in Jesus. Come on. And in verse 15, And 16, he says, I know your works. You know, this is something that we struggle with often, is the idea of works. The idea that I don't understand. Some people say, well, well, if Jesus Jesus did all the work on the cross, you know, if, if he said on the cross, it is finished. I mean, he's done the works. I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by grace. How is it that I still have to do works? Well, here's the difference between the Christian faith and the philosophies and the religions of the world. The philosophies and the religions of the world, you have to do works to gain salvation. You have to do works to become good enough for God to accept you. But in the Christian message, God finds you good in Jesus. God justifies you, forgives you, accepts you, adopts you in Jesus. Now, because you have been adopted, you begin to serve God with your works so that you can glorify glorify him in everything that you do. That's how we're called to live our lives. And Jesus says, I know your works. You know what he's saying? Guys, don't think I'm fooled by just the stuff you do on the outside. I know what you're like on the inside. I know what you do when no one else is looking. And as as I was reading and studying this, I said, man, I had to come to a place of conviction for my own life. I said, Lord, do I think that way? Do I think, well, wait a minute, how I treat this person? God knows that. How I, what I do with my money, God knows that. How I, what I think with my eyes, what I think and how I look with my eyes at people and circumstances, God knows that. But we, we often, what we want is, I just want to have fun. I just want to enjoy the Christian life. It's like my daughter. My daughter started going to kindergarten in September. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, as an Indian father, I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to make sure this child's going to learn, you know. I'm going to make sure she's going to get good rates, you know. Because this is the whole thing in our culture. It's like you've got to get all the marks. You know, when, when I was growing up, when I'd get home with, even if I got like 85 out of 100, right, I'd come home, I'd be excited. And my dad would be like, where did the 15 marks go? I'm like, Dad, I found 85. I only lost 15. He's like, that's not good enough, bro. And so I was like, okay, I'm ready. And so she starts going to kindergarten. You know, I guess my expectations are a little too high for her. Anyways, she she gets off the bus. So I come home, and then I say to her, I said, Lauren, how was school? She says, it was so much fun, Daddy. I said, really, what did you do? She says, I went to music class. I went to gym class. I went to arts and crafts class. I said, no, no, no. What did you learn? She would always change the topic. I'm like, what? And so then I found out that they, every couple of weeks, they actually send home the papers that your kids worked on. And then that, I would go through each paper. I'm like, oh, this D, you need to work on the D again, you know? And I said, work on that at home with her. And so the idea that it's not just that you're going to have fun. You're not just living your Christian life because it's like, well, I just do the Christian thing. It's like, what are you actually learning? What are you actually doing? What does your life look like? How are we changed because of our followership of Jesus? He says, you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, this is sort of another verse in this text that's sort of misquoted often, uh, which is the idea that some people say, well, what this means is Jesus is saying, I wish you were hot. I wish you were passionate, I wish you were boiling over, or I wish you would just walk away from me. I just wish you would not be a part of the family of God. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. But that's actually not what he's saying. The context here is, Laodicea 
as a city, was really rich. They had a lot going for them. They were a banking center. Uh, they were a center for certain kinds of medication for the eyes. Uh, they were a center for textiles. They would, uh, they would raise these sheep that would produce this black, glossy wool that would be uh, in high demand at the time. And so they were known for a lot of things. But one of the things they struggled with was water supply. Um, they, there was a city called Hierapolis, which was about six miles from Laodicea, and they had these hot springs that would come up with mineral-rich water. And people would come to these hot springs to find soothing and healing for different kinds of ailments. And then there was a city called Colossae, which was about 10 miles away, and Colossae had these naturally occurring cold water springs from the mountains. The water would flow down, and, and there would be this cold, refreshing water. The problem with Laodicea was when they would get the water uh, from one of these places, usually the, the places with the hot springs, by the time the, the water would get to their city through these terracotta pipes, uh, the, the, the water would be lukewarm, but still mineral rich. So literally, they would be used as an emetic, as something that would cause you to throw up for certain ailments, if you're trying to cleanse your system and stuff, they would use a little bit of that water because it, it, it would induce vomiting. What Jesus is saying to them is this. He's saying, I wish that you were fresh, life-giving, cold water. Or I wish that you were healing, soothing, a hot mineral bath. But he says, you are neither. You actually have no purpose. You're not finding yourself or making yourself useful for the culture you live in. Useful for the things that I've called you to do. This idea that they were apathetic. The idea that they couldn't care less. They, could, they were satisfied with carelessness, indifference, existing in a non-productive state, barren, not fruitful. This, this, this thought that they didn't have the presence of God energizing them. You know, if you take, if you take lukewarm water and you want to chill it, you need to apply a source of energy, right? You need to put it in the fridge. It's got to be energy to cool the temperature of the water. If you take lukewarm water and you, wanna, you want it to be hot, you want to boil it, you need a source of energy. But if you take hot water or cold water and leave it outside for a while, guess what? It's going to become lukewarm. It's going to just become room temperature. Here's the point. They were depending on their own strength. They had no outside energy. They didn't have the presence, the power of Jesus. They weren't relying on God for sustenance, for purpose, for vision, for mission, for what they were called to do. They were just existing. And Jesus is saying, because you just exist, you are of no use to me. Here's the question that we ought to ask ourselves. If you are a Christ follower, are you finding purpose in your calling? in Jesus. Not, not, I'm not asking you if you're a Christian. I'm asking you, are you bringing refreshment to people around you? Are people finding you like a cold, refreshing glass of water? Or are people finding you like a healing hot, hot bath where they say, man, when I hang out with you, I feel, so, I feel soothed because of all the pain that's happening in my life. Or when I'm hanging out with you, you know, when I'm parched and dry, it's like it's refreshing just hanging out with you, talking to you, experiencing Christ's love through your life. How do we find ourselves in our fellowship of Jesus? And then in verse 17, he says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. The worst thing you and I can do, those of us that are followers of Jesus, is say, I will do my own assessment. See, that never works, does it? Like you never go to a profession, go to a school, get a certificate, and they tell you, you just assess yourself. You decide if you're good enough. It doesn't work. But that's what we often do. If follow, as followers of Christ, we often say, well, I feel okay about the way I live my life. I feel pretty good about how I'm doing what I'm doing. I mean, there's some circumstances that make me not so passionate, not so excited, not so sacrificial, but there's good reason for those things. In my context, I'm doing just okay. Self-assessment. These people were deceived. They were saying, I'm rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. I've got it good. Everything's going great. But he says, you don't realize that you're actually wretched. You're actually pitiable. You're poor. You're blind. 
and you're naked. It's this idea that if they deploy their talent, their resources, their power, their wealth, they figure that anything that they want to do, they can do even without Jesus. You know, that's a dangerous place to be at. Where you're like, I have my life so well set up that I don't actually need Jesus in my life. We, we live in this deception because we live in a consumeristic world. Like this is our context in North American Christianity. We have so much stuff. This is why the, the storage unit industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Why? Because we don't know what to do with our stuff. Listen, some of you, you're like me. You have a closet with all of your clothes that you wear day in and day out. And then you have another closet called your hope closet. Come on. How many, who else has a hope closet? This is the closet with all the stuff that you should give away. But you're like, no, 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 no. Give it six months. Give it one year. I'm going to get back to that size. I'm going to get back to that weight. I'm going to eventually wear those clothes. And, and my wife will be like, honey, can I just throw this out? It's been a year. No, 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 babe. I'm working on it. F45, five times a week. I'm working on it. We're going to get there. So much stuff. We don't know what to do with it. And, and here's the danger. Here's the danger. When we bring consumerism into the Christian faith, into the church, then all of a sudden what happens is we, be, we, we begin to, to itch. We begin to scratch our own itch. We begin to satisfy our own needs. Here's what Eugene Peterson says. I, I think this is really profound. Listen to this. He's talking from an American context, but it applies to Canada. It applies to Western Christianity. Here's what he says. If we have a nation of consumers, obviously... The quickest and most effective way to get them into our congregations is to identify what they want and offer it to them. Satisfy their fantasies. Promise them the moon. Recast the gospel in consumer terms. Entertainment, satisfaction, excitement, adventure, problem solving, whatever. This is the language we Americans grew up on. The language we understand. We are wor the world's champion consumers. So why shouldn't we have state-of-the-art consumer churches? Where you say to people, the only thing that matters is, did you like the sermon? How did Fanu do today? Was he good? Did he make you laugh enough? Did he make you uncomfortable too much? Like, did he score enough scripture? Like, how was the historical context? When he pronounced the word RK, was that the right Greek pronunciation of that word? Like, like this is like, are you happy? Did the worship team do well enough? Did they get you excited enough but not too excited? Like, what do you want? Eugene Peterson, here's, here's what he says is the antidote to this. The operating biblical metaphor regarding worship is sacrifice. We bring ourselves to the altar and let God do with us what he will. We bring ourselves to the Eucharistic table, the communion table. Listen to this. And the, at the altar, and let God do with us as he will. We, sorry, we bring ourselves to the Eucharistic table and enter into that grand fourfold shape of the liturgy that shapes us. Taking, blessing, breaking, Giving. The life of Jesus taken and blessed, broken and distributed. That Eucharistic life now shapes our lives. So we give ourselves, Christ in us, to be taken. Us. Blessed. Us. Broken. Us. Distributed. Us. Into the lives of others for witness and service, justice and healing. That's the Christian life. That's the call of Jesus. It's not what you consume. It's what are you producing because of what you consume. Don't judge your Christian life by how many times you came to church on a Sunday in the year. Look at your Christian life and say, well, what did I do with everything I experienced in church this year? And so he speaks in verse 18, Jesus does, and he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. You know why he's saying this to them? Laodicea was so prosperous. When there was an earthquake in AD 60, all the cities around were destroyed, including Laodicea. They all took help, government funding, federal funding, imperial funding from Rome to rebuild their cities. Laodicea was the only city that said, we don't need your money. We will rebuild our city on our own. In fact, archaeological... Um, uh, discoveries have found that there were individuals and families that built entire structures. They had amphitheaters, they had gymnasiums, they had baths, they had all kinds of public buildings. And people, families, individuals funded it all on their own. But Jesus is saying, listen, you are fooled by your wealth. 
You think you have gold, but here's what you really need. You need a faith in me that's been tested and tried through fire. Tested and th tried through suffering. So that when your money fails you, you have someone that's stable, someone that's consistent, someone you can rely on, me, Jesus, that you can trust with your life. In Amos chapter 6 and 4 to 6, it says this, Woe to those who lie in be on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. This idea that you're so full of yourself with all the pleasures and the luxury and the stuff that you have in life that you're not thinking about those outside your life that need help, that are starving, that are naked, that are poor, that need you to intervene because of the gospel's sake, because of Jesus' sake, and make a difference in their lives so that you may be rich and white garments... Think about it for a moment. Think of what Jesus is saying. You are known for your black, glossy wool around the world. You are known as a textile place. You are known for the fabric you create. But here's what I want to say to you, Jesus says. In my eyes, you're naked. You need white garments for me. Here's what he's saying. Guys, you know what we do often? We fill our lives. We surround our lives with stuff to cover up the brokenness of our lives and our hearts. So often... You could claim to be a Christian sometimes, but on the inside, man, you're struggling in sin. You know, there's, there's addictions in your life, there's lust in your life, there's greed in your life, there's all kinds of things that are going on. Your marriage is breaking up, but, but you put up appearances on the outside. Right? Things are not good at home, but when you come out, everything looks great. And Jesus is saying, I see you just the way you are. And if you come to me, I will give you white garments. I will cleanse you. I will forgive you. I will restore you. And then he says, so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may, be, uh, may, may not be seen. And in verse 19, and salve to anoint your eyes. Again, here's what he's saying. See, when you read this without the context, you don't understand. Why is he talking about salve for the eyes? They were known. There's this literal, like, historical records of eye salve that was produced in Laodicea that people would come for vision problems. And Jesus is saying, you produce this medication for the eye, but here's the problem. You don't have correct vision. You're not seeing well. You don't have a vision for what I am calling you to do as a church and as a people. I love what uh, Martin Luther said Well, um, in, uh, uh, when he was in prison in the Birmingham jail. He wrote a letter. And part of what he said is this. There was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores, the customs, norms, behaviors of society. Small in number, they were big in commitment. They were too God-intoxicated to be intimidated. By their effort and example, they brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contests. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Here's what he's saying. If you're a Christian, you, have to, you ought to have a vision for your neighborhood, a vision for your community, a vision for your city, a vision for our nation. That is what it means means to be a Christian is when we look at the world, we don't just see it as it is. We see it as Jesus sees it. And we're moved to compassion, moved to help, moved to do something about what's going on in our lives. Village Church, this is why we exist. We want to have a vision. We have a vision in every city we're in. We want to make a difference in Surrey, a difference in Langley. We want to make a difference in Calgary. We want to make a difference in Winnipeg. In Toronto, we want to have a vision for the cities that God has called us to. So that the city will say, because this church exists, because these group of Christians are in our city, there's a different vision, a vision of hope and healing and holistic change that's coming to this place because of these Christians. 
Come on. That's what it's about. It's about the change we see in the world around us. And of course, in verse uh, 19, Jesus says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so, so be zealous and repent. Let me just talk about this word zealous for a moment here. So of course, Jesus says, those whom I love. He loves this church. He loves these people. He's like, that's the reason I'm speaking to you. I'm reproving you. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing discipline because I love you. And he says, I want you to repent. I want you to be zealous. See, part of what the Bible talks about often, especially in the New Testament, is this idea of a passion that exudes from followers of Jesus that is uncommon. Uh, you know, when you think about the word zealous, the same word zealous is uh, in the Greek translated also as jealous. You know, Paul uses the word jealous in a negative sense where he says, you know, you ought not to be jealous of people. And so you wonder why is Paul using the word uh, jealous and Jesus is using the word zealous? How does that really connect? Well, part of it is when you think of jealousy, what happens is you're putting yourself in the center of your life and your, your, your love. You love yourself more than anything else. And so what you do is when someone else is more popular than you, richer than you, more famous than you, has more friends than you, is more successful in some way, than you, you begin to have negative emotions and reactions to them because you're like, you know what? I, I don't like the fact that you're doing better than me because I should be at the top. I should be number one. I, I love myself more than anyone else. But when you take the idea of jealousy and you apply it to another person, what you begin to uh, uh, recognize is that, well, when you, when you set your love on someone else, with such intensity, there's an explosion of energy on behalf of that person. When you are jealous for someone else, you do whatever it takes to make that person happy, to further the interests of that person. See, what Jesus is saying to this church, I want to be clear, is not that they are hypocrites. Hypocrite is somebody that says, I follow Jesus, I love Jesus, but on the side, you're committing sin. On the side, you're cheating on your spouse. On the side, you're cheating on your tax. On the side, you're, you're doing stuff that, that is not congruent with what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's not the context here. It's not that they're committing sin. It's that they don't care about Jesus and his mission. They're not passionate. It's this idea that the supreme passion of their hearts, their highest love, has been set on something besides Jesus. And as a result, there's no jealousy for God. There's no zeal for God. There's no intimacy and passion and joy and wonder and faith in their walk with Jesus. It's just blah. It's just like, who cares? I'll just do the thing I should do, but that's it. What Jesus is calling for is people who not only believe that he loves them, but, who's, but people who have been changed because of Jesus' love. They believe it. They know it. And the controlling principle of their lives is to glorify Jesus. Is the controlling principle of your life to glorify Jesus. Leonard Ravenhill says this, the church used to be a lifeboat rescuing the perishing. Now she's a cruise ship recruiting the promising. We're called to be a lifeboat. No, no, when, let, me, let me rephrase that. You are called to be a lifeboat. When was the last time you went out on the waters looking for someone who's drowning? When was the last time you risked your boat for the sake of making a difference in someone else's life? When was the last time you said, my boat is not just for pleasure and leisure. My boat is going to be set apart so that people who are drowning in the, in, in, in the sin of their lives, who are drowning in depression, who are drowning in in blindness, if you will, not knowing where the shore is, not knowing how to find hope and joy and peace and love. That's what my boat is going to do. Thomas Aquinas said this, and I think it's powerful. He said, if the highest aim of a captain were to preserve his ship, he would keep it in port forever. A lot of ships, beautiful, beautiful, massive, lots of resources, lots of rooms, lots of space but they're still stuck at port because the captain's like, what if I chip the paint? 
What if I get a little battered and bruised? What if the ship just, just what if there needs to be some repairs once I get out? What if, what if I encounter a storm? But can I encourage you today, the call of a Christian, the call of the Christian church is not that we look and act like we're in mint condition, like we've never been used. It's that we would be completely used by Jesus, that we would, yes, we would be battered by the storms of life. Yes, we would go through some difficult times. Yes, we would sacrifice. Yes, we may not make as as much money as we could if we just lived for ourselves. Maybe we wouldn't open up our homes as much as we would. Maybe the paint in our homes literally would, would get chipped because we invite people to our homes because we open our cars and we invite people into our cars and we have to go to the car wash two times a week instead of once every two weeks. Like, like we, we are experiencing the wear and tear of life, but we say at the end of the day, it was all worth it because I was able to make a difference, make an impact in the lives of people around me with what God entrusted me with. That's the parable of the talents. It's not your house, it's not your car, it's not your money, it's not your job, it's not your ethnicity. My wife always says, Fanu, I don't even know what you are. When you talk to Indians, you're Indian. When you talk to Arabic people, you're from the Middle East. When you talk to Guyanese, my wife was in Guyana. When you talk to Trinidadians, my wife was from Trinidad. You just keep changing your story every time, every chance you get. I said, exactly, because every experience I have, every language I know, every, every story I have, everything that I am, everything that I have, everything that I can do, I want to use it for the sake of the glory of Jesus so more people can come to know him as Lord. That's what matters. Can I use my birthplace as an analogy? I will. The other day I was in a, I was in a, in a cab in, in Edmonton going to the conference. I spent 20 minutes, 20 minutes talking to this Indian man. And I told him about Jesus. I told him about God. He said to me, sir, he said, I'm a, I'm, he's, he follows the Sikh religion. He says, sir, I don't know God. He says, he says, I don't even think you can know God. He says, I've tried. He says, I went to the temple. I did this stuff. There's no way. And I said to him, I spoke to him in Hindi. And I said, Isu Masih can change your life. Jesus Christ can change your life. I said, Jesus made a way for you. And I spoke to him. I encouraged him. In that moment, I wasn't Canadian. I became Indian. Why? Because I want to win that man to Jesus Christ. Here's the question. Will you use what you have? Will you use the talents, the, the abilities, the context, the backgrounds, the languages, the, the skill set, the house, the car, everything you have, will you use it for the sake of the kingdom of God? That's what Jesus wants us to do. Why did Christianity become what it became? How did it conquer the Greco-Roman world? Let me just close with uh, with this. In verse 20. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. The historian Letourette says this. He says, you know, there's a lot to say about Christians. Um, They were were people who had the truth, people who were inclusive, people who were compassionate and caring and loving. Uh, They were people um, whose lives were radically changed. But he says that in itself doesn't explain why. Why did the Christian faith, like, take over the Greco-Roman world? I mean, they had so much persecution. They were... Fed to the lions. They were burned alive. Literally, Nero set Christians on fire to light his palace. Like, like, how is it possible? Because he says, he says, usually what happens is when this kind of thing happens, that community uh, who are persecuted, they go into guerrilla warfare. They, they, they hide and they attack. That's the response all throughout history. But it's like these Christians... They, they start loving, they start caring, they start making a, a, wanting to make a difference. When the plague hits, everyone's leaving the city. Christians, they're running into the city. What is happening? Why is this happening? You know what he says? He says, there has to have been. He says, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a theologian, so I can't tell you what it was. But he said, there must have been some explosive energy at the beginning of the Christian faith that energized the first disciples, that that energy was translated over multiple generations and centuries across the Roman Empire, that these people had a source that wasn't a natural, normal source. It wasn't something that you could motivate somebody with a motivational speech. 
This was something deeper. This was something more real. This was something more transformative. This was something they couldn't contain. This was something that they couldn't hold back. This wasn't the idea that, you know, we're like, well, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to, I don't want to say something that's going to make them upset. I don't want to talk about Jesus because what if they don't like the term Jesus? No, no. These people had a passion inside of them, a zeal inside of them that said, I cannot hold back what I have on the inside. It's what Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. What is it that made these people do that, he asks. And you know what the conclusion is? Tim Keller says this. Tim Keller talking about Le Tourette. He says, anybody who actually comes to grips with the message of Christianity, who actually met the risen Lord in person, became possessed with a fully orbed fanaticism. Not wild-eyed unbalanced, but fully orbed fanaticism. They were possessed. They wanted to be like Jesus. They wanted to please their Jesus. And Jesus is saying to the Laodicean church, anything less than that nauseates me. I remember going to India a few a couple of years ago, two, three years ago in Chhattisgarh. I was at a village preaching the gospel. And they, were, they, they, they went through so much persecution. As I was, I was backstage just going through my notes and I, the story came to my mind. I want to close with this. They said to me, sir, I said, Fenua, we've been, we've been working for many years in this city, in this town. There was no Christians here. Went through a lot of persecution. But he says, now we have so many churches in this area. The pastor said to me, we go in the middle of the night and we baptize people in this river. They show me the river. And, he, and I said to them, I said, how is it now? Has it gotten better? He says, oh, no. He says, it's just as worse as ever. He says, in fact, just the other day, last week, he says, two of our pastors, our uh, pastors in training, were caught in the village. They were, they were bound to trees in, outside the village and they were beaten up and left bound for days. He says, but that's okay. He says, because of their witness, many more are about to come to know Jesus. Wow. What are we talking about? What are we saying? Why would you do that? What do you gain from it? Who's going to appreciate you? Who's going to post about on Instagram? This message is going to be all over Instagram. Thousands of people. I'm standing in Surrey. I'm standing in Canada. There are people around the world. You will never know their name. You will never shake their hand. You will never applaud them for anything they've done, but they do it. You know why? Because Jesus says, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Once you've had communion with Jesus, you don't care about who recognizes you. You don't care about who appreciates you. You don't care about who posts about you. Everything you do, this is what the early disciples did. Remember when Jesus was resurrected? The Bible says they were afraid, they were hiding, and they were in a room by themselves. And you know what the Bible says? This right here happened. It says he walked through the door and he showed them his scars. And this is the beautiful part. It says, and he ate with them. The explosive energy that La Tourette is talking about is communion with Jesus. It's relationship with Jesus. It's knowing Jesus. And here's the question I want to ask today as we pray today. Will you say, I need to look. I need to look at where my life is with Jesus. Not if I'm saved, but am I useful? Is my money useful? Are my talents useful? Is my home useful for Jesus? Are my vehicles useful for Jesus? Is the company I work at, the office I'm in, is that useful for Jesus? Because maybe he's knocking. And he's saying, I'd like to come in and I'd like to take over all of your life so you can live your life for me. Let's pray. Jesus, you are, you are the master of our life. You are the one we serve. You're the one we love. You are the one to whom we belong. We don't belong to a church, Lord. We don't belong to a denomination. We don't belong to, to some name, Lord. We belong to you. And our lives are not based on what we do in these buildings, Lord. They're based on what we do with our lives. Today, Lord Jesus, we call on you. Come, 
come through the door of our hearts, our lives. We open the door, Lord, so you can come in. You can fill us. We say we are rich. We say we have no need of anything. Lord, we need you. We need you, Jesus. Fill our lives and fill our hearts with such purpose, such vision, such care for our world. So even those who don't believe in you will say, because these men and women live in this city, our city is better, our neighborhood is better, our community is better. They are cold, refreshing water to us. They are healing, soothing water to us. And so, Lord, help us today to live our lives for you, to give all of ourselves to you, Lord, so we can use what you've given us to glorify your name and to fill this world with the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray.